Now, I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing at the Prince of Wales Hospital, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And a lot of day in, day out cases are fragility, fracture patients for me. As a trauma surgeon, um, besides from performing operations, I also believe that preventing the second one is also very important. And today I'd like to share my views from a surgeon's perspective. Now, with the aging population amongst the orthopedics community, we're faced with a lot of challenges. Not only do fragility fractures sometimes lead to difficulty in fracture fixation, but also medically, we need to make decisions to best treat our patients. Most of us use the WHO guidelines for osteoporosis, but it's also important to remind ourselves that once there is a fragility fracture, we tend to already offer the patient with treatment for osteoporosis due to the high risk of another imminent fracture. But the question is, how is it best to approach the case and subsequent management? Now, take this case example of Miss X. She's an 81-year-old lady with history of hypertension and diabetes, pre-morbid a stick walker. She accidentally slipped and fell, landing on her buttock, complaining of hip pain and was unable to wait there. So as you can see, this is a very typical history of a hip fracture. And today I'd like to go through the process and how I would manage the fragility fracture patient. Now, this is the AP X-ray of the patient's pelvis, including proximal femurs. As we can see, there's a displaced left side neck of femur fracture with a broken Shenton's line. A lot of us see hip fracture cases in a daily basis, but a bone health treatment afterwards was often suboptimal in the past. We performed a cemented hemiarthroplasty for our patients, and the purpose of the surgery, as we all know, is for pain relief and to improve the mobility. So now, what after surgery? In fact, there are more than 6,000 hip fractures every year here in Hong Kong. And in order to improve the situation, myself and my team established guidelines in Hong Kong for the promotion and establishment of fracture liaison services um, in all hospitals to coordinate the management of these patients. We published this article in Hong Kong Medical Journal as a reference and standard for the management of fractures here. And as a result, now all our hip fracture patients in our unit received a geriatric co-care and most hospitals have also adopted fracture liaison services together with a specialized nurse coordinator. And I'm sure we all understand the importance in treating bone health, but what drugs would you use to manage your patients? Now, some common drugs that we often use in the fracture setting in our location are namely anti-resorptive drugs, including bisphosphonates and denosumab, and anabolic agents, including teriparatide and rumazuzumab. It's important to note that osteoporosis typically requires long-term treatment because we do not yet have a cure. And so often we need different treatments at different time points to best manage our patients. Skeletal integrity is maintained through a balance of bone resorption and bone formation. And each anti-osteoporotic drug have different mechanisms and side effects. An optimal therapy may require various sequences. But given the choice of drugs, how should we choose amongst these drugs? Now, it's well known that there are many risk factors for fragility fractures. But in an orthopedic setting, we often already encounter the first fragility fracture. And there has been increasing evidence that the recency of a fracture or the imminent fracture risk is even more important. So what's the evidence that we have that a recent fracture leads to a high risk of an imminent risk of fracture? Now, a recently published article in Archives of Osteoporosis also highlights the concept of imminent fractures, which are fractures that occur within two years of an initial one. And consistent with literature, we found that a large percentage of secondary fractures actually occur during this period. Therefore, this window of opportunity is also the most effective in the prevention of a secondary fragility fracture. A post hoc analysis has also shown that male patients are at even higher risk. Clinicians and allied healthcare professionals should be alert on these patients. And based on this, our fracture liaison services target this two-year period in particular. And based on our strategies, we show that prompt osteoporosis treatment and fracture liaison service coordination allows us to reduce imminent fracture rate to only 0.4% in our published study. This highlights the importance of fracture liaison service and hopefully will serve as a platform to improve solutions. So how does a recent fracture actually affect our clinical management? 
Well, there are numerous guidelines that have come up recently, including the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, um, American College of Endocrinology Practice Guidelines, and the IOF guidelines. Now, both guidelines present different findings, but one of the key points to treatment is actually categorize the risk of your patients. Now, take a look at how categorize the very high-risk patients. For the IOF guidelines, a recent clinical vertebral fracture, a previous fraction of age 80 years old or above, or a previous fraction family history of a hip fracture would be considered very high risk. As for the AACE guidelines, again, a recent fracture or a fracture whilst on approved therapy, multiple fractures, very low T-score, or very high fracture risk by fracts would be considered very high risk. Note that although both the IOF guidelines and the AAC guidelines have slightly different recommendations, a recent fragility fracture would be considered very high risk. I take the AAC 2020 guidelines as my reference, and for my hip fracture cases, I would classify them into very high risk with a recent fragility fracture. As you recall from our previous slides, the imminent fracture risk is actually very high for these patients, leading to this very high risk. And so this window of opportunity is also a golden period for prevention. And for these very high-risk patients, it's now been recommended that we should consider using bone-forming drugs followed by an anti-resorptive drug as sequential therapy, as there is currently convincing evidence that it is clearly effective not only in preventing bone loss, but also further increases hip and spine bone mineral density. Now, most anabolic agents are limited to 12 to 24 months, and the efficacy will wane once treatment is stopped. But the real potential of the anabolic treatment is that their greater effects in BMD and fracture can be maintained with anti-remodeling drugs. Now, in patients at very high risk of fracture, such as a recent fragility fracture, starting treatment with an anabolic agent seems most appropriately to promptly reduce the fracture risk as they have greater effects on BMD and reduction of fracture risk. Furthermore, numerous trials have also shown that anabolic drugs are superior to oral bisphosphonates and a faster increase in BMD. I'll be covering a few landmark trials to show how anabolic drugs have been found to be superior. And here are some of the evidence. Look at a Vero trial where participants were randomly assigned to receive either teriparatide and oral placebo or oral resigenate with injection placebo for 24 months. At 24 months, new vertebral fractures occurred in 5.4% in the teriparatide group compared to 12% in the resigenate group. Clinical fractures also occur in 4.8% in teriparatide group compared to 9.8% in the resigenate group. And so amongst postmenopausal women with severe osteoporosis, the risk of new vertebral and clinical fractures is significantly lower in patients receiving teriparatide, demonstrating its superiority. Another landmark trial would be the ARCH study. In this study, postmenopausal women with osteoporosis and a fragility fracture were randomly assigned to receive either romazuzumab or weekly oral, oral alendronate for 12 months, followed by alendronate in both groups. I'll be covering more of the results later in our slides, but in this study, results show that at 12 months' time, romazuzumab had a significantly lower number of new vertebral and clinical fractures as compared to alendronate, again demonstrating the superiority of bone-forming agents compared to oral bisphosphonates. Now, given that treatments of anabolic agents are limited to 12 to 24 months and that efficacy will wane once treatment is stopped, the real potential is that the greater effects in BMD and fracture can be maintained with anti-resorptive drugs once stopped. There's now convincing evidence that after switching treatment, sequential therapy further increases BMD. So for Miss Y, she was mobilized the next day by our physiotherapist and Dex of the lumbar spine came back to be negative free and she was given a bone forming agent. And here's some of the evidence showing sequential therapy further increases bone mineral density on reducing fractures. Now, if we look into the data switch study, this was a 24 month study in which postmenopausal osteoporotic women were randomized to receive teriparatide denosumab or both drugs. In the extension trial, women originally assigned to teriparatide further received 24 months of denosumab, whereas subjects originally randomized to 24 months of denosumab further received 24 months of teriparatide. 
In fact, after 48 months' time, spine BMD increases the most in teriparatide to denosumab group compared to the others. For the total hip, bone, and femoral neck bone mineral density, this was also increased more in the teriparatide to denosumab group compared to the denosumab to teriparatide group. This also clearly demonstrates a successful sequential treatment. Coming back to the ARCH study, results over the whole period of the 24 months showed a 48% lower risk of new vertebral fractures in a romazuzumab to alendronate group compared to the alendronate to alendronate group. The risk of hip fractures was also lower by 38%. In postmenopausal polls of women with osteoporosis who are at high risk for fracture, remezuzumab treatment for 12 months followed by alendronate results in significantly lower risk of fractures than alendronate alone. Again, this demonstrates the success of sequential therapy from anabolic agents to anti-resorptive drugs. Looking into the FRAME study, postmenopausal women with osteoporosis were randomly assigned to receive remezuzumab or placebo for 12 months. After that, patients in each group received denosumab for 12 months. At 24 months' time, the rates of vertebral fractures were significantly lower in the remezuzumab group than in the placebo group after each group made their transition to denosumab with a 75% lower risk. This study again illustrates the success of sequential therapy. Now, it's not uncommon where a patient comes in with a fragility fracture that was on previous bisphosphonate therapy in the orthopedic setting, but how should we treat these patients? For me, as this is a recent fragility fracture, and also there was an occurrence of a fracture despite treatment, I would again categorize these patients as very high risk. Now, as we all recall, in these cases, we would have to consider the use of anabolic drugs to best increase the bone mineral density and reduce the fracture risk. The question is, which anabolic drug should we use now? Now, the Structures trial aims to answer this question by comparing the effects of 12 months of romazuzumab versus teriparatide on BMD in women with postmenopausal osteoporosis who had previously taken oral bisphosphonate for at least three years and also had a BMD T score of negative 2.5 or lower and with a history of fracture. Patients were randomized to assign to remezuzumab or teriparatide, where the primary endpoint was the percentage change from baseline in aerial BMD in the hip through 12 months. And it turns out that the mean percentage change from baseline in total hip BMD was 2.6% in a remezuzumab group and negative 0.6% in the teriparatide group. Now, transitioning to a bone forming agent is common practice in patients treated with bisphosphonates, such as those who fracture whilst on therapy. And in these patients, remezuzumab leads to gains in hip BMD that are not observed with teriparatide. And so we may need to consider the use of remezuzumab, which has dual effects by increasing bone formation and decreasing bone resorption when we decide on transition from bisphosphonates. Now, besides on bone health, a published systematic review had shown that sarcopenia can also occur in up to 95% in males and 68% in females with fragility fractures. And in these patients, based on this, this reinforces that fracture surfaces should also focus on muscle health as well. There's currently a pressing need for further research on sarcopenia. And for our patients, we advise and refer them to do exercises as well as nutrition. Going back to Ms. Y, she was also diagnosed with sarcopenia. Physiotherapy was referred for walking and resistance exercises, and dietitian was also referred. Supplements of calcium and vitamin D were also given. It was fortunate that during her follow-up for two years, there was no further falls or fractures. She was then treated via sequential therapy with an anti-resorptive agent, and she was able to walk with a stick independently as well. So as a summary of the management at my unit, each fracture patient is thoroughly evaluated. In patients, we have an orthogeriatric co-care. The patient is also referred to the dietitian and physiotherapy for rehab. Now, as a recent fragility fracture is considered very high risk, preferably a bone forming agent is used. But in a public setting, the patient is covered only if they have a history of two or more fragility fractures and a very low T-score. So in general, zoledronic acid or denosumab is used. The DEXA scan is offered for all our hip fracture patients. Upon prescribing the drug, 
The patient is monitored with DEXA every two years. As for the targeted treat, the treatment target would be at least more than negative two and preferably to negative 1.5. And if the T-score was greater than negative 2.5 to begin with, I would go for at least 1.0 T-score unit improvement. Once target is reached, if the patient started off with an anabolic drug, sequential therapy would be offered. And if the patient have reached a target with bisphosphonates, they would go for a drug holiday. And for those that have reached treatment target with denosumab, they would either continue or switch to a bisphosphonate. With that, I'd like to thank the audience, and I hope my sharing was useful. Music